Welcome to the NCDWI Guy podcast, where defenders of the Constitution assemble to prepare for courtroom battle, and firm owners gather to develop marketing strategies that will revolutionize the practice of criminal defense. Here's your host, the NCDWI Guy, Jake Minnick. Hello, fellow freedom fighters, and welcome to another episode of the NCDWI Guy podcast. Today, we are talking about, drum roll please, the one leg stand. That's right, the one leg stand. This is something that we can use in and out of every consultation, in and out of every officer report, and in and out of every trial, right? One leg stand repeatedly comes up, so let's make sure that we know how the one leg stand is supposed to function, what the clues the officer is looking for. Let's make sure that we know this better than the officers know it. Let's get this done. So in terms of evaluating a one leg stand, let's start with this basis. Let's start with this thought process. In the student manual. And this is where most of the information today is going to be coming from. In the student manual, session seven, page 15, right? This is the Bible, the student manual for the 24-hour NHTSA course. This is the Bible for cross-examination during a DWI trial, cross-examination of an officer. It should always be referenced back to the student manual for the 24-hour student course, the student manual for the A-Ride course, the student manual for the DRE course, one of the instructor manuals. This is how officers are trained to perform field sobriety testing. And so we want to call them out if they're not following their training. So session seven, page 15, it says a field sobriety test, quote, must be one that is reasonably simple for the average person to complete as instructed when sober. Tests that are difficult for a sober subject to perform have little or no evidentiary value, end quote. I don't know why that is in there because the walk and turn and the one leg stand are not simple tests to perform for an average person when sober, but it's important to have that be the background if you are doing a jury trial. That is something that you could bring out almost in relation to any field sobriety test other than the horizontal gaze because there's really nothing that the person uh, being tested has to bodily do. You can be uh, literally sitting for that test under certain circumstances. So there's nothing really that needs to be done. It's a matter of following the, the stimulus and then the officer is looking for the clues. But most of the other tests are not reasonably simple tests for an average person to complete as instructed when sober. So it's helpful to remember that. Also, and this is in the student manual in session 12, page 39, officers are told, quote, be certain that you can do in court all the tests you ask the defendant to perform at the time of the arrest. If you cannot do them, the jury will not expect that the defendant could have done them properly. Okay, that's in the manual. It's telling the officer that they need to be able to do the test, right? So if you see an officer giving instructions on video in regards to the one leg stand, and if I uh, at any point during this session say one legged stand, make sure that whoever is listening sends an email to Anthony Palacios and tells them what an idiot that I am for saying one legged stand because I know that that will set Anthony off and I will receive a nasty gram from Anthony on that front. So uh, make sure that I'm not saying one legged stand at any point. So I will try to make sure that I use the correct one leg stand terminology. But be certain that you can do in court all the tests you ask the defendant to perform at the time of the arrest. If you cannot do them, the jury will not expect that the defendant could have done them properly. Okay. So if you see an officer messing up on the one leg stand in terms of instructions or demonstration, 
he's having trouble maintaining balance for the five seconds that he's showing the person that is going to be asked to do the test how to do it. Bring that up in district court, obviously, but definitely bring it up in front of a jury because then you can say, the officer can't even do the test, right? This, and you know, we know that the officer's not impaired at the time of the arrest, but he can't even do it for five seconds. He's asking my client to do it for 30, right? So make sure you bring that out. If you have a case in district court or in superior court, don't be afraid to ask the officer to step down and give the instructions exactly as he gave them in court. Maybe it won't be the first time. Maybe it won't be the second time. Maybe it won't be the fifth time. But at some point, when you ask an officer to step down and demonstrate the one leg stand, they're going to have difficulty balancing. And that's just going to look bad. And the reason why they're going to have a difficult time balancing during the one leg stand is it's a difficult test to perform. That's what I don't understand about this test and the language that I just read about it should be an simple test for an average person to perform when sober because it's not it's just as simply not a simple test to perform and so even if it's only one out of ten times that the officer messes up during what they're kind of showing in their demonstration phase it's going to be something that a judge remembers right it's going to be something that will change future outcomes not just the outcome in the particular situation that you're dealing with that shows the officer uh, not being able to do the test in the courtroom. Clearly, it's going to help in that case, but it's also going to help down the road. If the officer doesn't mess up, doesn't fall over while they're demonstrating in the courtroom, then it's no biggie because that's what everybody is expecting. Nobody's expecting the officer to not be able to demonstrate the instructions properly. Everybody expects that the officer checked every box. So there's nothing to lose. There's nothing that you can lose by asking the officer to step down from the stand and demonstrate the instructions and demonstration that he gave to your client on the date of the charge. Got nothing to lose, so might as well try it. So let's dive into the one leg stand. Um, In terms of the times that the one leg stand is supposed to be given. So when should a one leg stand test be administered? That's the first question. When should a one leg stand test be administered? There are certain test conditions that must be in effect in order for a one leg stand test to be rightly administered. I'm reading from the manual again. Quote, The one leg stand requires a reasonably dry, hard, level, and non-slippery surface. Subjects safety should be considered at all times, end quote. Okay. So a reasonably dry, hard, level surface. Now, what if you don't have that? So this is from the 2018 manual. What if you don't have a reasonably dry, hard, level, and non-slippery surface? Well, standardizing this test for every type of road condition is unrealistic, the manual says. You can't do it for every type of of road condition, so the standardization doesn't take into account all of these other non-dry, non-level, soft, slippery surfaces, right? It doesn't account for all of these. So um, you have to be able to account for this. You have to be able to account for this to be an issue. So, when looking at the original research, the manual says, the study, uh, the studies from the original research said that the test must be performed on dry, hard, level, non-slippery, and relatively safe uh, surfaces and conditions. If you don't have that, the research recommends, one, the subject be asked to perform the test elsewhere, or two, only the HGN be administered. That's your options. So if you don't have a reasonably dry, hard level or non-slippery surface, then you have two options. One, ask the subject to go to a place that does meet these conditions, or two, only administer the HGN. 
The manual goes on to say that recent field validation studies indicate that varying environmental conditions have not affected a subject's ability to perform this test. But there's not a whole lot of research that is given there. And why do they then keep the original recommendation of only asking the subject to perform um, HGN or to perform the one leg stand and walk and turn in other areas? So I would point that out. Anytime that you have a client, uh, specifically if you have a client that does well on HGN and there's not much else uh, to show in terms of impairment, but you have a client that does uh, poorly on walk and turn and one leg stand, you can point in the manual to both the walk and turn and the one leg stand and say, Your Honor, one leg stand requires dry, hard, level, and non slippery surfaces, as does the walk and turn. There wasn't a reasonably dry, hard, level, and non slippery surface in this particular situation. Therefore, you can't. You can't consider that. You can't consider the results. It's not just, well, maybe this kind of impacts how the test was done and you should take that into account. No. Judge, the officer has two options in this particular situation. He can go find a reasonably dry, level, hard, non-slippery surface, or he can administer only HGN. In this case, he didn't go find a hard, dry, level, and non-slippery surface. Therefore, you should not consider the results of the walk and turn and the one leg stand because of the fact that his training, the manual itself, gives him options of what to do if these conditions are not readily available at the roadside. So make sure that you point that out. Make sure that you point that out to the court. It also says that the original studies suggest that Individuals over the age of 65 or that have back, leg, or inner ear problems or are overweight by 50 pounds or more may have difficulty performing the test. It also suggested that individuals wearing two-inch or higher heels should be given the opportunity to remove their shoes. Make sure that these conditions aren't present with regards to your particular client. Don't just assume that your client doesn't meet some of these particular requirements of giving a fair and accurate test. If you have a person over the age of 65 with back, leg, or inner ear problems, is wearing two inches or higher shoes at the time, is not asked to remove them, or is overweight by 50 pounds or more, don't let up on that. That's important in terms of being able to say whether or not that test was appropriate. And what is the, the what does the officer typically say when the test is given on a poor road condition, right? So where you don't have a dry, hard level and non-slippery surface, or where the person is over the age of 65 or has back or leg or inner ear problems. Well, you know. I, I took that into account, but I wanted to give the driver the opportunity to prove that they were not impaired. I wanted to give them that opportunity, even though we didn't have the right road conditions. Well, that's, that's fair enough, but it's also not a fair opportunity. This isn't a benefit of the doubt scenario where you are asking people to do difficult tests under conditions that they don't even show any real value, any kind of standardization in terms of how the testing clues can be interpreted, that's not giving the person charged the benefit of the doubt. So don't let the state make that argument to the judge in closing on a argument related to probable cause or when using the one leg stand in closing to show that your client is impaired and should be found guilty of DWI, that's not the benefit of the doubt. No, the one leg stand, Your Honor, shouldn't be considered at all because it wasn't given in a fair testing condition situation or because one of these specific issues in terms of the validity of the clues was present because of my client's age or weight or medical issues with back and leg. 
because of the footwear that they were wearing. You can't consider this because it's just not fair. So don't let the state argue, oh, the officer was just trying to give the person the benefit of the doubt. That's not what that is. That's, that's basically giving them the opportunity and the likely opportunity of failing the test. So officer is supposed to give specific instructions to the client on the one leg stand. So this is the officer supposed to say, I want you to stand with your feet together, keep your arms at your sides and maintain this position until told otherwise to do so. Do you understand the instructions so far? So the officer needs to tell them to stand with their feet together, arms by their sides and maintain that position and then ask them, do you understand the instructions so far? That gives the driver the ability to ask questions, you know, make sure that there, there is no concerns about the test up to that point. The officer then continues with their instructions and he will say, or she will say, at the point that the individual says, yes, I understand the instructions so far, when I tell you to start, raise either leg with the foot approximately six inches off the ground, keeping your foot parallel to the ground. Keep both legs straight and your arms at your side. While holding that position, count out loud in the following manner, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and so on until told to stop. Keep your arms at your sides at all times and keep watching the raised foot. Do you understand? All right, so they again give the person the ability to ask questions based on that additional set of instructions. Why are these instructions important? Well, because the instructions are standardized. They're part of the standardization of the test. They need to be delivered the way that they are written into the manual. Otherwise, you don't have a standardized test going on. If you don't tell the person to keep their arms by their sides and then they raise their arms, that seems like a ridiculous clue to be marking on the test. If you don't tell the person to keep both legs straight, then they can't be expected to keep both legs straight. And so when they say, well, it was a, a cue, not a clue, that the person was bending one of their legs. Well, if you didn't tell them to keep it straight, then that doesn't make sense. If you don't tell the person the appropriate way to count, and then you're indicating in your notes, well, they, they didn't show any of the clues, but they didn't count appropriately, did the officer tell them the appropriate way to count? Then the officer will say, go ahead and perform the test. The officer should always time the 30-second demonstration, and the test should be discontinued after 30 seconds. So it's the officer that is counting that 30-second timeline. In addition to giving those clues, there is also supposed to be an actual demonstration, right? So the officer is going to show how to raise the foot, how to keep the arms down by the sides, and how to count. They're going to give a demonstration on how to do that. Again, if you see the officer having difficulty with balance or anything else during that time frame, then you should make note of that. So in terms of the test interpretation, the officer is looking for four things. The officer is looking for a person that sways while balancing. So this refers to a side to side or back and forth motion of the body or a swaying motion of the foot while the subject maintains the one leg stand position. There is not a specific inches for this particular scoring clue. It doesn't say you have to sway back and forth at a six inch um, diameter or uh, move one direction this particular distance. It just refers to a back and forth or side to side motion. I see this frequently cited but often than not observable on video. So video can be very powerful in terms of the sway because I think most judges and most people, when they think of a sway, think of something that is pretty noticeable. And on video, you may see that it is not. In regards to this specific clue, the Manual says that slight tremors of the foot or body should not be interpreted as swaying. Slight 
tremors of the foot or body should not be interpreted as swaying. So make sure that, again, if there's minimal swaying on video, you bring that point out from the manual. Second clue, uses arms for balance. The subject moves arms six or more inches from the side of the body in order to keep balance. This refers to both arms, arms plural, uh, six inches or more from the side of the body in order to keep balance. So both arms being used and also to keep balance. So if somebody is adjusting their glasses, if somebody picks up their uh, hand and scratches their face, that's not using arms for balance. So it has to be both arms moved six inches from the side and that movement has to be a balancing movement. Hopping. Subject is able to keep one foot off the ground but resorts to hopping in order to maintain balance. So scooting back and forth on the roadway, that's not hopping. Literally like picking your foot off the ground, your planted foot off the ground is what is necessary in order for this to be a validly indicated clue. And then finally, the last clue is that the suspect puts their foot down. Suspect puts their foot down. The subject is not able to maintain the one leg stand position, putting the foot down one or more times during the 30 second count. It says, if the subject puts the foot down, give instructions to pick the foot up again and continue counting from the point at which the foot touched. So, Officers timing this whole interaction for 30 seconds and then looking for those four clues. Based on the research that the officer is informed about, if an individual shows two or more clues or fails to complete the one leg stand test, there is a good chance the BAC is at or above 0 0.08. Using the criterion, you will accurately classify 83% of the people you test as to whether their BACs are at or above 0 0.08. So what this says is that if the test is done in the appropriate conditions, dry, flat, hard, non-slippery surface, to an appropriate person, a person that's not over age, not overweight, doesn't have the wrong type of footwear on, doesn't have any medical issues, so done in the appropriate conditions to an appropriate person, the officer gives the appropriate instructions and then sees two out of the four clues of the test, then there is an 83% good arrest decision based on the studies. So again, you have to have appropriate road conditions, appropriate uh, instructions from the officer, appropriate person being tested, being asked to submit to the test, then you can get to this likely, likelihood of being at a 0.08 or higher in regards to the one leg stand test. Now, here's something that I often see missed and I've referenced this in a couple of past episodes, but oftentimes I see the officer go through his instructions for the one leg stand, explain which clues uh, he's looking for, explain which clues that he saw, and then they move on to the next part of the investigation. So the DA asks all the questions about, was this a good row condition? Who was the person you were doing it with? Were they an appropriate subject to be doing? Did you give the appropriate instructions? What clues are you looking for? What clues did you see? Ultimately, the, person, the officer says, I saw two out of the four clues or four out of the four clues, and then they move on to the next phase. What does that do to the one leg stand test? It makes it totally irrelevant to the whole arrest decision because it's only when the officer says, if I see two out of the four clues, then that indicates to me a probability of impairment or a specific 83% likelihood that a person is impaired, that I am placing under arrest. Only then can the judge in a particular hearing on probable cause or in a particular trial use that information to say, well, this was then an appropriate arrest. 
the officer has to indicate that, has to tie what he's seeing in the one leg stand test back to the research. So where there is no connection between, well, what does the clues that you see on the one leg stand mean for interpretation? Well, just because somebody is swaying a little bit while they are standing there for 30 seconds, doesn't indicate anything to the judge. Now, our judges have heard the one leg stand testified to a thousand times, but you need to remind your judge in this particular hearing, Your Honor, there was no connection made from the one leg stand that was done by the officer to having any meaningful evaluation of whether or not my client was impaired. There was no indication of the research. There was no testimony presented about why two out of four clues is an issue. So make sure you tie that back in. Again, use the one leg stand, attack the one leg stand. It's going to come up uh, very frequently on DWI cases in terms of how you're communicating with your client during the consultation, evaluating officer reports, and preparing for cross-examination during trial. Hope you found this helpful, and I look forward to speaking with you again next time. Hope you enjoyed today's episode of the podcast. If you did, please share the podcast with another freedom fighter in the criminal defense community and be sure to leave us a rating on iTunes. See you next time.